I appreciate it. <laughs> Take it on. <laughs> That's great. Um, thank you very much. And um, Ellen, uh, my I have a very uh, close place in my heart for uh, the AMC. Um, uh, both being a, a 46er a couple times over and having my son who uh, I'm very proud just just got to that accomplishment at 17. So we we had our kids up there early and often through the tail through the uh, trail tantrums and uh, now uh, dropping me on every trail that they possibly can, as well as my my daughter who is getting up there close and my wife this summer just hit her 46th as well. So um, it's been a rejuvenating, beautiful place uh, to um, really take in the power of uh, the power of nature and the power of E.O. Wilson, biophiliac, um, you know, just all things, all things ADK, a special, special place. So um, thank you very much for, for having me um, tonight. Um, I'm going to leverage uh, 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 some visuals um, more for uh more for myself uh, than probably probably you guys. It keeps me um, uh, it keeps me a little bit focused and and on um, message. You should be seeing a title slide right now, hopefully. Um, and uh, I, I thought what I'd do is I, I'm not going to. Uh, I promise not to bore you to death. I'm going to make three promises to you. Uh, I'm definitely not going to yell at you. Most of you. Uh, have been doing this work a lot longer than I have and uh, have a lot more credibility in this space. Uh, and although while I love polar bears, I am not going to talk about polar bears tonight. Um, we're going to talk about uh, three basic, I think, kind of things that I'd like to share with you um, and 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 pretty simplified down for, for my uh, dumbed down perspective. But what is it that we mean when we talk about sustainability? And I know that may seem very, very obvious to this group, but um, I'll, I'll extrapolate a little bit on that when we get there. Um, I'm gonna spend a good chunk of my, my time in the why. Um, and again, that may seem really self-evident, um, but when I say why, I'm talking about why for our larger audience. And so how do we bring um, diverse constituencies into this work? and um, and into to, to really climate action, which I use kind of interchangeably with sustainability because our strategy being really, really broad. And then finally, um, the how. Uh, how are we doing this at, at UB? And um, you know, how do we see this as kind of a model? It's not anything original. It's, it's things that we've stolen and borrowed from other people as well. Um, but how we can think about climate action, um, more of the strategy side of things. So that's kind of the, the, the frame that I'd like to, to, to talk through tonight. Uh, happy to take questions as you have them. We can wait till the end too. So whatever whatever you'd like to do there. Um, so, you know, we use this term sustainability kind of broadly. And um, I am a uh, card carrying tree hugger, uh, probably like many of you uh, being from the Sierra Club, um, which I got my, the first time that I really engaged with the Sierra Club was down in DC doing democracy work when I first got out of law school. And um I absolutely was so super impressed with the national organization and the work that that it did um, and seeing kind of it's both political strategy and, and obviously environmental policy. Um, but this this term sustainability, um, we really think of at the university are uh, we have an amazing indigenous studies department and. The Haudenosaunee, as probably all of you know, five, six nation states, depending on when you when you count that, um, and and us being on most of us being on Seneca territory right now, uh, you know this this i this idea of thinking long term of uh, considering our deliberations and our our decisions over the course of seven eight generations time period, which is where, of course, seventh generation out of Burlington, Vermont, the, the commercial company gets its its uh, um, kind of identity. But it, it was really the Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee who, um, I think, from my perspective, um, had kind of the essence of what it is when we say sustainability today, what we're, what we're really talking about. Um, I, I tend to do the opposite of what most environmentalists would would maybe um, push for, um, and I and I there's this hopefully a strategic reason for that. 
I, I try to get us to think about that it's not about saving the planet. Um, the planet has gone through five, seven major extinctions. It will go through some more. Um, sustainability at its essence is really about us, our ability to have the quality of life um, that we have now and or better. And, and as you know, we're not on that track. So again, sustainability is very human focused, um, not necessarily ecosystem focused, although of course we need those ecosystems for life support in order for these organisms to, to continue to, to survive and, and thrive. There's really two ways that uh, we talk about this at the university. Um, one are the SDGs, which I absolutely love. Um, all 200 nation states, roughly 200 nation states have embraced these. Uh, it's founded in 2015, moving to 2030 off the heel of the millennial goals. And they, the reason I like them is um, they're a lot more complex than what I'm showing here. Of course, there are sub-targets and metrics and um, about 30 different sub-targets under each of these, but they they help us understand what it is we mean when we say this, this word. And um, they're of course, very, very broad. Uh, yes, it's about life on land and life below water, 14 and 15, which we would kind of think of from an environmental perspective, but it's also about lifting women and girls up and alleviating poverty, ending hunger, um, and yes, uh, you know, affordable and clean energy, climate change, um, sustainable communities, all of those things. But it gives us more of a definition of what it is we're talking about when we when we say this this word. Um, the other way we think about it here at the university, and well beyond, of course, is really this idea of a of a triple bottom line, um, or this framework of how we make. Uh, smart strategic long-term decisions. So yes, squarely centered in the um, environment and the planetary ecosystem um, boundaries that we have and how do we create those life support systems I was talking about earlier, but it is also just as much about people and how we treat one another, how we harness all of this intellectual capacity, not just some of it being privileged. And then the third part is, um, you know, yeah, we also live in the real world. So how do we, you know, UB is a $1.7 billion enterprise. How do we pencil things out at the end of the day? Um, how do we make decisions to, 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 um, for our economic health and, and, and well, well-being of the institution as well? So we think about all these things um, uh, as leading towards a future that we want to live in and that we want to 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 try to guide. And that's when I say that term sustainability, that's that's our idea. That's what we uh, uh, really are thinking behind that. And all of that kind of centers around this. Um, it took me a few years in this role, but to to kind of figure out um, something I should have figured out a lot before then, but that sustainability is not a goal. Um, we're not constantly working to be sustainable. Um, sustainability is a strategy. And what I mean by that is um, I had a former president who I worked with here at the university who I was in a different role and I was running some of our government community relations. And I'll, I'll never forget, this was a very teachable moment. And uh, I, I went up to him and I we were we really needed to invest in the South campus community and neighborhood. And I voiced that and I said, John, we really need to create a task force to do X, Y, and Z. And he said, Ryan, why should I do that? And I said, John, it's the right thing to do. And uh, President Simpson put his arm around my shoulder and I was like, oh boy, here comes the teachable moment. And John said, I have a lot of right things to do, Ryan. Um, and that really struck with me because I think all of us have tons of right things to do every day that we need to do. And that argument, I think, has been at the core of a lot of environmental arguments for the past 30, 40, 50 years. And I'm not sure it's been, um, I'm not sure it's the only argument we can use. And so what, what I would offer is, is that, uh, it, it has to be something more than that. It has to be something more than just the, the, the moral argument, if you will, unfortunately. Um, and, and that really uh, brings me to kind of the why. Um, why is it that we do this work? Uh, yes, it is because it is the right thing to do. 
But there are a lot of other um, avenues of reason. And I think these avenues give us, um, or these arguments give us different ways to talk to different people and to connect with different people. So we, you know, one of the questions we obviously always grapple with is why aren't we doing more on climate? Why aren't we all understanding this? This is a no brainer. I'm playing to a very friendly audience tonight. Um, why is that? And, and I think it's because oftentimes we're not speaking human. We're not speaking in a language that our audience or recipient can resonate with. Um, it might resonate for us environmentalists, but it may not resonate for the target audience that we're that we're talking with. So I, I really see um, six kind of key areas here uh, that 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 we are focused on here at the university in terms of justifying or not justifying, but fueling really, I guess, our work. Um, and the top three are the ones that are the most important personally to me um, and, and our work, uh, the science, AKA our faculty and, and what the data is telling us, uh, our quote unquote customers, our students, I hate talking in that language, but but they're, uh, you know, they are our, our base. Um, and then of course, um, the, the, the regulatory framework that we work in. And yeah, there's a business case, there's the resilience argument. And of course, there's always the right thing to do, our values um, that, that really guide us. So I'm gonna walk through each of these at kind of a higher level to really try to just put an explanation point on this why. Um, and, and I start with um, the science and hopefully that's not too choppy on your end. Um, but this is Professor, uh, this is Professor Jason Briner right here. Um, you can always tell where he is because um, he's letting his undergraduate students uh, be closer to the Cabin Glacier here. Um, <laughs> he is a, uh, a phenomenal individual and he's one of many dynamic uh, faculty in the geology department who are really doing um, amazing, amazing work. Uh, this is a class that he teaches up on the Greenland ice shelf. Um, and uh, one of the pieces that they're doing, again, this is in the middle of the Greenland ice shelf, they will pull up these core samples uh, that are either ice or mud. Um, and then when you take those core samples, which is the photo you see in the, in the middle of that slide right there, um, and I imagine this is all kind of old news to you, but I, I do just want to kind of put a, an explanation point on some of this. Um, you know, what, what they are able to do, and if you ever come on campus and you're looking at the Cook Hostetler building, it's one with a lot of pipes coming out of it near Capen, uh, the fourth and fifth floor are just filled with all of these core samples in freezers. And when you look at them and you plot out the uh, dissolved CO2 and other carbon emitting gases over time, you plot them um, uh, and on the vertical axis, we have parts per million on the horizontal axis, we have uh, 800,000 years in time. And what you start to see is a circadian rhythm that the planet during the Holocene has, has uh, really developed here, right? And that circadian rhythm, those are actually, those peaks and valleys are actually the ice ages um, that we've seen over time. Uh, and that is all a very normal kind of, if you will, breathing of, of life that we've had and, and this environment that's created this great world for us to live in um, over time. Uh, the, the rub is of course that that line of 300 across it really represents kind of the, the safety zone, if you will, of dissolved CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, as you know, the story, the hockey stick uh, graph here, uh, you know, when us messy, silly humans started really uh, uh, experimenting through the industrial revolution, the unintended consequence of, of creating a lot of pollution and, and not really realizing, but Unfortunately, uh, that has had a now disastrous effect on the ecosystem that we call home. Uh, and we have gone well over that 300 or 350 parts per million and are eclipsing well of 400 right now. And therein kind of lies the rub. Um, I think this is all old news to, to all of you. Um, but that's what's given us um, the extreme weather that we have beginning, just beginning to understand. Uh, and whether it is the the fires, uh, not only in this country, uh, but others, uh, or 
waking up this summer uh, in the Northeast to the smell of, of forest fires, uh, which is a, a pretty wild thing if you are, are living in this part of the country, which most of us have never had unless we've lived out West, uh, to the growing uh, temperatures in our summers over time. This is a great piece from the New York Times that uh, uh, just was in the other day. I just want to do those again for you just to kind of show so that we're looking at basically um, time periods here, uh, mainly from the 80s onwards with the uh, gray kind of being normal, uh, 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 the blue being cool and, and orange and red being hot. And as you look over time, plotting uh, on temperature, you can see what has happened. Uh, this is not rocket science. I think all of us really know this, um, but it's startling when you see it in that graphical um, form uh, to really show what uh, what is happening with our, our our summer temperatures here in the in the northern hemisphere. But it's not only the fire, of course; it's the flood. This is Fort Myers from. Um, you know, a little over a year ago. This is California last winter. Uh, this is the Hudson Valley uh, back in June um, and uh, New York City, uh, not more than um, uh, probably about a month ago right now. Um, so we really are, and that was just a, no, that was three weeks ago. And that is just a one day uh, vertical streaming event uh, uh, that really overwhelmed the city's, city's infrastructure. So, um, this is the part of the presentation where everyone's totally depressed, and um, this is why I never get invited to any dinner parties. Uh, but this is the turn. So this is Sophie Nowicki, um, one of our uh, geologists at the university. She's an amazing person, um, and she's a phenomenal scientist. Uh, she is on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, those 200 scientists across the globe who really give us the, the, the data and the pulse of, of where we are and where things are going. And so this quote really kind of sums up, you know, that we are in a tough spot here, but we are in a critical place too, where we still have time to, to really avoid the worst pieces and not even the worst, but the, the pieces where we won't be able to get the genie back in the bottle. So if you think about ocean acidification or the melting of the permafrost, uh, in the Arctic, those types of things that then have the power to release a lot more emissions and destabilize our, our planet even more. And so we have this window to really make that change. And I think that's really the message that um, we really need to focus on right now. And it is about a 10, eight year window uh, that, that we have to, to kind of work with. So that's the science, kind of depressing, but but that's where we are. And I don't think it's probably any big surprises to, to you all. Um, here's some of the good news. Um, our students here at the university, and for that matter, most of uh, uh, any of our youth in a millennial and Z kind of um, age category are, are really doing amazing things. Um, and I, I say that because the Deloitte uh, survey that goes out every year. It used to just be called the Millennial Survey. Now it's the Millennial Z Survey. Um, as you can see from those blue bars over on the right, uh, it, it, it really is top of mind for them. Cost of living has always kind of went out. That's a very acute, <laughs> acute focus for all of us. But it's climate change that is um, at the top of their mindset. Uh, that's not true for other generations uh, when you when you poll them. And, uh, you know, some, some more uh, kind of... Uh, I would say um, really concentrated and, and sad kind of uh, uh, facts are, you know, when, when you think about it, they are, um, you know, 40, almost, almost a majority are saying that, you know, the feelings this is affecting their daily living. And the one that, that really jumps out at me is three quarters of them, right? So they thought this, the future was frightening and over half said they think humanity is doomed and 40%, I believe, um, are, are not, are, are saying, we don't want to bring children into this world. That is a, a, I'm a, I'm a curmudgeon Yankee New Englander from New Hampshire. And I, I was like, oh, come on, et cetera. I, I now see this daily from people. And the reason that they have climate anxiety is not because they're weak or this or that. It's because of the last bullet. They are going to live their entire lives in this world where we now have these types of extreme weather events growing at an exponential clip. 
all of us on this um, call have had the privilege of not necessarily living in a lot of that. And that is why um, I think they are so much more honed in on this issue when you when you look at the stereotypical breakdown over over time. For us, this is really important. I call this kind of my provost slide because um, there's a there's a way to to I think harness that frustration, which is they are very focused on um, aligning their choices with their beliefs, and so. When I share with, with my provost, Scott Weber, that 72% of the students who we really want are focused on what an institution does for climate change, you know, that that's an important factor in where deciding to go to school, that's something that really um, holds and, 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 and gains resonance because that has not been the case. And so rankings and ratings are really important for us to play in that game, which give me more of a push to move our sustainability work forward at the university because there is a demand and a value um, for that. So that was the science, that was the students, and I'm gonna go to kind of the third most important one, which is, um, you know, we'd like to stay out of the pokey, if you will. Um, there is, uh, you know, just an unbelievable amount of uh, really strong sustainability climate legislation that has been enacted over the past five years, five, six years in New York, led off by the um, uh, uh, the Climate Leadership Community Protection Act, of course, but many other small kind of Green New Deal pieces of standalone legislation that when taken together, really form a, a, a very strong policy here. And great organizations across the board like yours, like the Nature Conservancy, the League of Conservation Voters, and, and so many others who are, who are making this stuff happen. Um, you know, we have no more coal-fired power plants in the state of New York. That's a, that's a that's an unbelievable thing. Yes, aided by uh, the market and and uh, and and others, but but also um, you know the decarbonization of investment funds, the the phasing out of ICE vehicles, internal combustible engines by 2035, and and so many others. So the third reason we are doing this is because we have to uh, in New York State, and and of course. At the federal level, uh, a little over a year ago now with the IRA passing, I keep telling my mother it's not the Irish Republican Army, it's the Inflation Reduction Act, um, you know, a huge incentive and in fuel to make this stuff work. Um, and just kind of as an explanation point on that, the Vice President Harris, uh, I think it was all, uh, exactly a year ago that she was here at the university um, uh, to roll out really the IRA and and, and push that forward. And, and this legislation has really been a game changer. Um, and it's funny because it's not getting that much ink yet, but where you see it making big, big changes is across corporate America right now. Um, because it, 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 is a, it is tax treatment, but it is also a very predictable budget economic model. And so, Yes, it's set up to try to bring clean energy and manufacturing jobs back to the U.S., but it's also set up in a way where it's very predictable for companies to make smart long-term decisions by investing in renewables, geothermal, EVs, weatherization, et cetera, et cetera. And the initial, the reason I have the slide is because for those of you who remember the 2008-2009 recession, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was a huge amount of money that President Obama put into the field right in his early start. I just want you to, to, to take a look at what, you know, what that in parallel or in comparison to the other three climate bills and the CHIPS bill, bipartisan infrastructure, and of course the IRA are actually all climate, that they're all focused on climate solutions. And so you can see what we're talking about for money. And, um, you know, most forecasters right now are saying it's actually twice this amount because it's not an appropriation, it's a tax credit. So it doesn't have a cap. It's whoever takes the tax credit. And what they forecasted on this slide, we're seeing twice the demand right now in terms of uh, what people are, or what companies are ordering and, and production values, et cetera. So it's a really interesting thing. And for us here at the university, it's really great. We can't take tax credits, so this wouldn't really help us but there's a provision in there that allows for direct pay. What we would have got for the tax credit will be offered in cash so that we can actually leverage that. 
as can other 501c3s and like the Sierra Club and other entities. So that's that's really important. So again, we talked about uh, the 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 science. We've talked about the students or the or the consumer, and we've uh, also talked about um, uh, the the kind of uh, the legal or the the law piece. The business case is another area. This is Larry Fink, who uh, is the CEO of BlackRock, the largest uh, by 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 far out there managed funds. It's seven trillion in assets, and uh, you know we have seen a huge shift in the business community. And again, it's not because it's the right thing to do. It's because there's a lot of money to be made, or there's too much risk for them. Things that you all have always known. But quite frankly, I've been wondering why it's been taking them so long to, to make this type of shift. Um, but we are seeing that happen. Um, we need some more clear rules from, from, from government, but we're seeing a lot of that move in the right direction right now. And the other side of this is the acquisition of talent. So 70% of US workers said that a firm's environmental record is important to them and is a, you know, is a major consideration when deciding whether to take a job with a company. So this recruitment of talent is, is really, really vital. And that comes back to what we talked about earlier, because it is the recruitment of Gen Z and millennials with that climate change focus. Because in two years, 2025, down at the bottom of this screen, the workforce will be 75% made up of millennials and Zs compared to back in 2019, where we had a much more mixed in workforce. This is a huge transformation that's occurring. And so it's an economic and talent message to the market that, you know, if you're not paying attention to this and you're not aligning yourself with finding climate solutions, being responsible and lowering your footprint, prepare to become irrelevant. Most people think that Amazon, um, you know, that they they kind of, that Jeff Bezos just got religion on climate and they just wanted to move that way. They got there because their Seattle workforce walked out of their headquarters several years back in protest that their company was not doing enough on climate. And that sent such a shockwave through uh, leadership that in order to retain that highly talented workforce, they better step up. And they have been decarbonizing ever since. So that's the why uh, and, and continues in. So again, kind of a larger pitch there for all the why. That's kind of my second area. And my, my third and final area, <clears throat> forgive me for just a second, I need a sip, really uh, focuses on the what. And I, I think this what can be... Um, you can make this what work um, in any sector. I'm gonna give you how it looks in the higher ed sector, but I don't think it's unique to us at all. It just gives you a little bit of an idea of when we say, how are we decarbonizing? What does that look like? Um, for us, it's really built around this thing we call UB's 10 and 10 strategy. So 10 years, 10 different initiatives run by 10 different university leaders with committees on all of those working to really bring us down to zero. Um, and so I start with, um, you know, our first one uh, and three integrators, which I'll get into in a second. I start with this first one, which is, you know, we've given these kind of catchy names so that they can resonate with people who are not in this world all the time. But this idea of clean energy across the board, much of our strategy comes down to and is centered and anchored in electrification. And in order for that to work, we need to have a clean source of electricity. So we've got to get that down to renewables. And then it's about decarbonizing our heating source, natural gas, phasing that out, right? Creating a localized uh, investment, uh, excuse me, offset program. And that's run by Bill McDonald out of our provost office. The former one was by Tonga Pham in our facilities office. Um, putting a price on carbon. So pricing carbon in an economic model that's run by Beth Corey, uh, our university controller. Uh, our investment strategy with the foundation, Stacy Knapper, who is our executive director of the University of Buffalo Foundation. How do we decarbonize that? Um, our food source, right? 25% roughly of the average American uh, 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 climate footprint is in because of what they eat. Um, so that's a huge component 
uh, for us. And then our waste and materials, we're just bringing on a new leader in that space. Our mobility um, is led by Chris Austin, uh, who runs our parking and transportation. Uh, this kind of, uh, this is run by uh, uh, Chris, who just came in as our new HR director. I haven't been able to update the slide. This is the messy, silly humans and how do we create behavior change? And then finally, uh, increasing efficiency on the technical side. <clears throat> and that is run by Bruce Berger. So think like HVAC, uh, uh, heating, ventilation, and cooling um, efficiencies in the electronics, et cetera. And then there are these three integrators uh, that are run throughout all 10 of them. The first one is resilience that Jess heads up in our emergency planning, climate justice, uh, which is run by Jason Corwin of the Seneca Nation and our Indigenous Studies Department. And then making it happen, which is this idea of leveraging our faculty's research capabilities and our students' experiential learning. If there's one visual I want you to take away from tonight, it's this one. 10 different ideas led by 10 different university leaders with three integrators. And that's really like how we are trying every day to, to reduce our emissions. So I'm just gonna reinforce this essentially by giving you some proof points under each of these areas. When we think about our renewables, this is what we've been spending a lot of time on more recently. For those of you who have been on campus, you've probably seen this or read our propaganda from our newsletter. Um, our uh, renewables started way back. Walter and uh, Simpson did some amazing work, who I know many of you know, um, is always in our in our thoughts. This is the Norton roof array, which was is probably about 15 years old right now. Um, and uh, that brought us through over to the solar strand, which we believe is the most um, accessible renewable energy landscape in the country. Um, no fences. The idea was to really uh, try something very new and, and get the idea of a centralized power plant kind of out of our, out of our lexicon. Um, uh, and then uh, we did our first offsite buy. Uh, down at uh, Steel Winds. This is the former Bethlehem Steel site, as probably many of you can see. That's Lake Erie and the wind turbines off in the upper left there. Uh, we are the off taker for this project, meaning we purchase all of that electricity. I love this project because there was nothing else that was going to be done with this land. Um, it's still very hot land. We actually couldn't those those uh, solar panels, those PVs are actually on cement blocks. We couldn't drill into the land because of its toxicity. Um, so I think of it as a really good use of, of, of that space. And then more recently, this past December, we activated uh, 12 new megawatts of solar energy on UB's North Campus. Uh, uh, you'll notice that we took some of the lessons of the solar strand. There are no fences around our, um, around our renewable energy uh, on, the, on the North Campus. Uh, that was a tough battle we fought and finally won with, uh, with our developer. Uh, this is, uh, you are looking at the stadium and the campus. Uh, uh, that's Ellicott, uh, the residential complex off to your right there. Uh, this is five megawatts on the extreme eastern edge of campus. Uh, three or four other ground mount systems on the western edge of campus along Visor Creek. Uh, five or six different uh, rooftops, depending on how you, how you count. And it was really, um, I learned a lot through this project. It's not easy. Um, I think we, we, we could move much faster now, but you know, uh, our existing building infrastructure is not set up to deal with adding solar from a structural integrity and many other areas. So we know now that every building that we build, we need to build to be solar ready. Like that's just a no brainer for us as we, as we go forward. So all of that um, and other offsite purchases that I didn't mention um, get us to um, all of our electricity right now is, is pretty much carbon free and that accounts for about a third of our overall emissions. So we've had some success. We have a lot more work to do in order to, to get to a hundred percent. And that's really, that's really the work. But decarbonizing that electricity is key because in order to, 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 to move our mobility strategy forward, all of the commuting that our faculty, staff, and students do to campus is, is part of the footprint that I'm responsible for. Um, yes, our buses and flights and things of that nature as well. 
while we are certainly embracing um, the idea of light rail coming out to the North Campus, that is a long ways off. Um, we are certainly embracing public transportation and other things, but it is electrifying the vehicle that's at the center of that strategy. And to do that, we've we put in about uh, 35, 40 different EV chargers on the on the campuses right now, and we'll be scaling that more. Um, we are actually reviewing as we speak right now. 50% um, of our bus fleet to transfer over to electrification, um, which we're really excited about uh, for the for the UB Stampede. Um, and then our own fleet of three, 400 vehicles, uh, as we go to buy new vehicles, we are we are trying to buy all electric. Um, so it's 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 really been a journey and and trying to do that. And these are, you know, for our for our trades guys and gals. You know, the most important thing is that it works. It's it, you know, et cetera. And and it's really cool to see them uh, leverage this new tech and and be really happy with it. These are not kind of the early EV stuff where it's kind of like, well, it only works when it's sunny or this or that. It, they're they're real quality vehicles um, that that get us there. Um, and then finally, in this area, we're working right now with NIPA on creating our first EV charging fleet lot of up to 50, 70 different chargers just for our fleet to keep them going. So there's a chicken and egg thing here. If I ask our community, our, our um, campus community um, teams to go out and buy EVs, they need a place to charge them. Um, and th that's, a, that's not an easy thing to just quickly go like that. So we're working on that at the same point. Our waste, our zero waste strategy, um, you know, I think by most counts, 40% of, of carbon footprint in this country it comes from products, what we make and the materials that go into that. Most of that is embodied carbon. Uh, we have really committed to divert up to 90% of our materials here at UB. We have work to do to get there. Our current system is not going to be the vehicle that helps us with that. <laughs> um, we are moving to a ROT system, ROT being recycling organics and trash. And the idea is to really ramp up the recycling component of that get the organics out of the trash stream and, and move from there. Um, so uh, we're piloting out um, some of those on campus right now, but the, the big area is, is that we're building a brand new strategy and it's really set up on these, these four kind of things. So identifying the waste generated, this, this visual is from many of you probably know Aaron Muscati on my team. Um, this was from uh, a month ago where we were doing a campus wide waste audit, tithing through and understanding what the waste stream is really producing, investing in that rot infrastructure I was talking about earlier, um, and really trying to bring people into this. It's one thing to create a system, but you need everyone to use that system and understand it and know what is recyclable, what is not, et cetera. And building that trust and confidence is, is critical to us. We have, we have some work to do in this space, um, and, and that's, that's really what we're trying to embrace right now. And then our food system at the university, this is an area my colleague Derek Nichols does a lot of work in. Um, I've, I've learned a lot in this space. He's a, he's a great leader in that. One of the things I'm really excited about is in the next month, we are rolling out. Um, uh, you know, the only way I can really explain it is when you go to order some food at a, um, at a kind of food counter at the university, you know, you see the name, you see the price, you see maybe the calories, well, now you're going to see a carbon count on that food, which I'm I'm just so excited about. So that hamburger is going to be loaded up with with carbon, and we're kind of using a a low, moderate, high, um, you know, designation on those things versus that salad would be a obviously a lower carbon count. And again, this is something that you know you don't need sixty thousand dollars to buy a Tesla. Um, this is something you can do as a student every day when you're going to buy food. Um, et cetera. So we're excited about, about that. And we've got some really great food diversion programs that our students have been um, leading and getting that into the hands of, uh, or into the mouths of, of, of those who need it. Uh, just a couple more here before I, before I finish. And um, the one that, that keeps me up <laughs> at night mostly is this one. And it's the idea of how do we decarbonizing, how do we decarbonize our heating and cooling systems? And the reason this keeps me up is because um, we're talking about 200 buildings at the University of Buffalo. It's a it's a small city, 
Um, and, and how do we do that? So we just finished, actually earlier today, I just presented this to our senior leadership at the university, the South Campus's Clean Energy Master Plan or Decarbonization Plan, um, and how we go about doing that. Uh, it's a 1600 page study. If you can't get to sleep, it's a great document. Uh, and it really lays out for us, um, these are called Sankey charts, if you don't know. I didn't know before I started this. Um, the black line is natural gas. The yellow line is electricity. And um, red is, is steam there. And uh, so your sources are on the left side. On your right side are kind of where they're going. This is probably very difficult to read. All I want you to see is, is that there's a lot of natural gas. And these lines are weighted for how much energy they have. We got to get rid of all this. <laughs> that is, in order to decarbonize, that's where we need to go. This is the model that the study gets us to and creates a pathway for us to do that. So essentially, we are transitioning nearly all, except for some backup systems um, in case of emergency, into electricity through a geothermal and heat pump model that brings us... Um, uh, into a fully electrified campus versus burning natural gas and then using that to heat certain things. Um, this process uh, over time, to just to give you a visual idea of what it what it looks like, this is our existing, um, we've got two buildings that we're working on right now to already do this work. Um, and this is the uh, uh, steam piping that exists on the campus as a whole. Our first step, um, and these are meant to, to um, you can do these in different orders, but the greens are geothermal wells and different piping and electrification on different parts of the campus over time. So this is over in the Kerry farber sherman area and then doing more geothermal wells underneath Rotary Field and others that then supply as well as um, the Great Lawn and uh, of course Clark Hall and the area there. So we really feel like we have a, a solid plan now of knowing how to do this on the South Campus um, uh, over time. And, and like I said, we've already started doing that. Uh, so we've been trying to build the airplane while flying it. This is um, uh, 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 Crosby Hall, or maybe this is Foster, two twins, um, and, and working again with heat pumps in the buildings and district-wide so that it's all connected together. So essentially we are moving from steam to 140 degrees and it's 140 degrees of moving energy in that that the heat pumps can leverage to really create that you know the climate that we need in these buildings um, over time the last piece i'll mention on this is that um yes we have moved forward already and we've leveraged um some matching funds from nyserta to do this on the north and we just selected a vendor to start that so for the next year We'll now be doing what we did on the south on the north so that we have these these strategies to be able to uh to do to do that just a couple more and i'll keep it really high level here we're also trying to build a localized offset program for those emissions that we can't get to right now i want to be really clear our um goal is to uh focus on things we can do we are not trying to um to buy our way out of this um we need to be responsible for the pollution that that, that we create. Um, uh, but there are a few things right now that um, we're not going to stop doing. Uh, I need to get our faculty to research conferences. That is what they do. And to do that, they need to fly. Um, so how do we lessen that bad? Well, uh, the strategy is is a market per, buy a market purchase of certified credible offsets, incredibly important to us. And then working with our community partners, we're knee deep in this work right now of how might we create a localized offset program that benefits our local community um, through afforestation or transitioning low income communities um, away from natural gas into electrification or heat pumps. And then also some, some work on our own campus uh, with our students and, and things of that nature. And then I think our final one here, which perhaps is the most important is pricing carbon. So Microsoft and others have been doing this now for quite a long time, building into their budget models um, what, what we environmentalists would um, always get labeled as, uh, the business community would say externalities, right? Like clean water and, and clean air and, and, and pollution. 
And so that social cost of carbon is incredibly important and using economics as a way to move behavior the way that we need to, to move it um, is something uh, very much in our minds. We have, um, so, so carbon pricing as the World Bank, uh, I think it is kind of, you know, defines here. It's, it's trying to price those emissions uh, that, the, that the commons, if you will, have been paying for um, and, and factoring them in to, to really kind of change our, change our behavior, if you will. We're doing that in, or we're attempting to, to, right now, we're just getting our strategy together. We've started on the first one. But we're doing that in four areas. Uh, these guys that were heading down to the ball game a couple of years ago uh, from from our football team. Uh, the travel component, we we basically have digitalized all of our travel so that we can count all of it. We had a real problem with trying to identify the the, the footprint. Um, you know, you can't manage what you can't measure. So the first thing was to get everyone on that system, um, and then starting to purchase offsets for the amount that we know is happening and, and then integrating that into the local level to have those units be responsible for those um, economically so that there's an incentive that's that's mixed in. We're also trying to build some models um, for capital construction. Most of the time, uh, capital dollars and operational dollars never talk to each other and they come from different streams. So you get these perverse incentives of uh, when you go to build a new school of engineering, uh, let's just say it's a hundred million dollars. Uh, and, uh, but let's say you want to put solar on its roof. So it now becomes $104 million or whatever, maybe it's 102. Um, and, uh, well, we don't have that much capital, but had you done that in, in three or four years, you would have made up for it operationally in reduced electric bills. Never mind the next 15 years where you're getting free electricity warranted solar panels over that time. So how do we think about that, bring those together and make smarter long-term economic decisions that benefit um, the climate? And then finally on our buildings, um, how do we think about right now, there's one utility bill, one meter for our entire campus. And that, does, that separates accountability and responsibility in this space because uh, Every building, you know, is kind of stewarded by a different school or, or entity, and so there's no real incentive uh, per se to to conserve, other than the right thing to do. So models that we've been looking at at Yale and um, uh, Arizona State University are built around this reverse budgeting model. So how do you uh, think about what the average would have been over five years? give that kilowatt average to the Dean or whoever is stewarding that building and say, look, we'll pay you what that fee. And if you uh, save kilowatts, we'll, we'll let you keep some of that money. If you use more than that, then you got to find some revenue to pay in. And so the idea on this, again, we have not advanced this. We're, we're having conversations around this right now, but the idea is to align that responsibility and accountability uh, to create lower emissions over over time. So I'm going to pause there. I'm going to actually, I'm going to stop there. That was a lot of information um, that I just uh, threw out. Um, but I, I, I thought what I would try to at least do is um, is kind of give a, a frame of what it is we, we mean um, by sustainability, what it is, uh, why we are doing this work and and what it looks like uh, in terms of the, the the how and and what climate action, at least at UB, uh, starts to parallel. So love to take any um, questions, uh, comments. I especially love when people don't agree with me um, uh, and have um, different views uh, uh, that the or um, or comments that they'd like to express. So I'll I'll pause there, John. Okay. Well, thank you for the uh, great overview there. Um... Do we have any questions that uh, that we've been sitting on for the last half an hour here? I'll jump Larry? in. I just go ahead. Go ahead, Larry. Oh, um, I, I was wondering. I uh, I heard that you uh, have you're building a lot of electric charging stations on campus. Are you building any of the uh, 
rapid chargers? It's a great question. So there's, um, I, I've been uh, personally driving an EV now for uh, a little over 10 years. And um, they, you know, there's, there's kind of three levels. There's the regular plug outlet called a trickle, which takes, of course, forever. There's the level two, which is like our dryer outlets, which we all probably use if you have an EV. And Larry's uh, point is that the third one, uh, uh, kind of the third, third phase of that are the fast chargers. Uh, Tesla calls them superchargers. Um, we did, we did look at that on the South campus, actually more for our community and whatnot. We got tangled up in tons of legal challenges, um, with that as a state entity. I'm continuing to look at it. We're looking at one right now for our fleet, and I'm trying to keep our minds, uh, open here at the university for other ones. They're very expensive, um, compared to the level twos because it's not just the charger. It's the, in what I found is it's the it's the run. It's it's coming from where that power source is to where you have them. And most of our buildings are a little bit away from those parking lots. And so you're talking uh, most of the times hundreds of thousands uh, to do. But we're doing that in that um, fleet EV charging lot. We will have one there. Um, and then we're looking at some other ones uh, to, to, to do as well. Yeah, good question. And, and I uh, expect that uh, when you uh, charge your car there, you get charged. Is that correct? You, you do. And the reason being, um, well, I'd love to incentivize it. We had some pilots out there for a little while that were not. But um, the state of New York does not let us give away um, power like that. Um, and so it's, it's more, uh, it's a little bit less of our policy and more of the the state's policy of of stewarding taxpayer dollars and doing that in an equitable way what we were successful with though you are paying a lot less of a rate than you would pay at home to charge that vehicle um so i'm trying to pass along the lower rate in electric bills that the university pays because it's a big user um but they're really meant to try to um you know, we don't want to become a gas station, right? Um, but we do want to be able to tr try to provide incentive for people to 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 use EVs. Um, something that's changed pretty dramatically over time is, um, you know, when I started driving in 2012, I, you know, I live in East Aurora and I had to put my, my Sorelli uh, winter boots on uh, to drive to the university because if I turn the heat on, I would not have enough miles left to get back home at night, right? Um, but now, you know, um, most of the EVs on the market offer a 300, 270 mile range to get around for almost all of us, 90, 95% of our driving, that works really well as long as you have access to a charger where you live. But we still wanna be able to provide that um, right now we're meeting need with the chargers we have on campus for our community, um, but we're 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 paying very close attention to that because, of course, that's that's increasing. Yeah, Bob. Certainly could do. Go ahead, Larry. Go ahead. I just uh, just wanted to say it's certainly good to see uh, that many new charging stations coming on board. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, Ryan, I was just going to ask about. Um, you said you mentioned how many students are really concerned about climate change, and are there are they volunteering, or is there any way we can get involved with some of the volunteers or some of their? Can we help direct them, or can they help us? I, uh, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I mean, the Sierra Club, right, is such a institution and has such great brand value recognition out there um it's i mean it's it's obviously one of the one of the more um impressive groups um out there I, it, it's interesting i i really love um what mckibben has done i'm sure most of you know of bill mckibben's work um and this kind of like the third act that he's been advancing i just think it's so i would say right i mean i'm just being very blunt i think where we need the most work is with Xers, my generation, and boomers. Like we really need to work in that space. Um, mm. That's where right now the, the the challenge really is. I um 
I tend to kind of just try to get out of the way of a lot of our, our Z's and millennials because I think they are, um, you know, they're moving in that direction that I think we all want to go. And quite frankly, it's, it's uh, as you guys know better than me, it's a lot of the folks in, in Washington and who have been established in those positions for a long time. And, um, you know, that's where the resistance is. I'm not worried about this generation. Um, I'm worried about them being able to get into power to make decisions quickly. Um, because as we all know, the science on this, who, who cares what you think or don't think? It's going to just continue to do what it's going to do. Um, and uh, so so I, I, you know, I tend to try to like um, providing tools for them, um, but also, you know, really just empowering them and uh and and trying to somewhat get out of their way, I guess, is 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 kind of how I think about it. I don't know if I really answered your question. Well, that was good, but I, I I'm just wondering you so you referred to uh, the third generation, which are not the the younger people. I, is I, were you implying that maybe we should be reaching out to some of the students or? No, the opposite. I, I think Bill's McKibben's his third act, he calls it. And I think by that he, I, you know, I haven't read, he has this great book and it's got a catchy title, it's something station wagon cross and something else. If anyone else knows it, throw it in the chat. Um, but what, what he's really doing is he's focusing like, uh, you know, of, of really trying to recapture the boomer generation to advance climate action. And I personally think like that's where we need the work right now. Um, and that's where we really need to focus. It's not the younger people. Um, I think we need to try to get them to be open to the younger people um, to, 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 to really kind of uh, do some of these people. So he refers to it as himself. He's in that generation um, as, as this kind of third act of his, of his own. Right. And it's a great, um, yeah, just Google third act Bill McKibben and you'll you'll see that that come up. That's great. Thanks, thanks, man. Yeah. Eileen. Ellen. Oh, oh sorry, Ellen. Sorry, I got, um, you, got your name wrong there. Apologies. I, I agree with that. I don't think students really want to be organized by us, although we spend an awful lot of time complaining about why we're all so old. <laughs> me too. Room. And my kids don't uh, want to be organized by me either, Ellen. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I agree with, I, I can agree with that. Um, but one thing boomers do is they vote and they mostly yeah. vote against climate um, yeah. policy. Young people don't vote very much. Yes. And I think something we would love to help with, but maybe don't know how, is organizing voter registration drives and showing and just making it known to students that if they don't vote in this next election, it's pretty much game over. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we never want to give up, but um, there's some very drastic things at stake, obviously at the national level, at the state level too, where we're seeing some backing down from the CLCPA. So yep. while we didn't really mean it, stuff going on, including yep. in state government agencies so um we just need students to to vote their interests and their interests is surviving yeah that's such a great point ellen i i totally agree um i think that's where you know i have to be really careful as a quote-unquote state employee i can't mm -hmm. i can't quite get into that i certainly do that in my personal time um but i think that's a really great area where lcv league of conservation voters um, which does really great work in that space. I know you're C4, um, uh, you know, uh, the 501C4 for for Sierra uh, gets involved in in some of that as well. But I do, I think that's a that's actually a great area where you can, you know, really kind of lend your volunteer time, et cetera, with organizations who are already doing that, reaching out to them and saying, hey, look, we want to do vote mobilization, registration, you know, and there's, and then you sign up to, you know, you pay your 25 bucks or whatever, and you get in the student union and, and table and talk to students and things like that. But through that organization or your own C4, I think that's a great way to do things as, as, as well. It's, um, yeah, uh, you know, you can't, um, 
we can't have a conversation tonight without looking at uh, the ramifications of of who leads, right? Whether that's globally or um, whether that's in this country and the rocky past that we've had over the past, you know, seven, eight years. Um, yeah, voting matters. I mean, e e you know, I, I still don't understand why um, the current administration is not getting as much credit as they deserve. The IRA is a revolutionary uh, climate bill. I get it that it doesn't do the stick and all that, but we haven't had any climate legislation in 35 years. I've been working on it for quite a while and um, to see the amount of revenue, it's an incredibly smart bill that we will look back on decades from now saying like, wow, that was a game changer. Um, and uh, yeah, you don't have, um, you know, if that vote doesn't go the way it went uh, three years ago. You, you don't have that bill. Um, and, and for that matter, congressional races as well. Um, so yeah, or, or I could just settle for a functioning house of representatives, I guess, but I, you know, I'll lower my standards. So. And Ellen, really quickly on this, I think that you make a really great point and it's a great effort to, to, you know, undergo a lot of the Gen Z population is still not a voting age yet. And this next year's election is going to be very interesting to see. Um, how things change. I'm a Gen Z and my first time voting in a presidential election was four years ago. It was like my first time doing that. So I think it will be the, the younger populations like that graph you showed, Ryan, are going to take over and they have opinions. So um, hopefully that will change some things too. But, you know, voter accessibility and education is a huge part of this. Yeah, Emma, you're 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 right on the money. But to Ellen's point, one of the pieces, and we've seen this with every every generation, including mine, like, you know, they they tend not to vote until they're a little bit old. We we've got to break that. Like we've got to get um those values that we were talking about earlier, Emma, that I know you are so aligned with. We gotta get them to the polls. <laughs> like it it just you know, it's it really does um, make or break at the end of the day, those those policies. And they're doing what they're doing now in the House and other places because they don't believe there are consequences to those actions. And, you know, to some extent, they're right. Right. They'll they'll do that as long as they they possibly can. But I'm going to be careful and not talk too much more about politics because I'd like to keep my job for a little bit longer. We won't turn you in. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Helen. I appreciate that. Yeah. Any other questions or, or comments? Yeah, I don't know if you can answer this one directly. Uh, you had mentioned through your, a couple of times in your talk that, you know, a uh, university is like a large city. Um, if you were doing this, the programs that you're doing right now on the at the university and trying to get them to be instituted in a city like Buffalo, yeah. what what challenges would be different and you know, are there things that we can focus on where we can kind of push push the government people in the right direction? Well, I think they're very different, right? I mean, let's let's all be honest, right? We're we're much more privileged. Um, we have more resources. Uh uh, you know, it's um it's just a different beast. Uh and and while I think we are incredibly diverse at uh, UB, we have, um, you know, we, we are always ranked up high with that, both economically, racial, et cetera. Um, we don't have the same challenges that the city uh, has. And so I wouldn't begin to um, stole advice on on how the city uh, moves forward with, with their climate action strategies. I'm very happy that, um, uh, a former uh, a former student um, who's been doing amazing work. Uh, this was quite a while back. Kelly, who is who is now the coordinator for climate action with the city, um, just an awesome awesome person. Um, and and I and and there, I do believe the city is very sincere in trying to achieve that. But it is a big big challenge, and it is like it's really hard work. Uh, there's no blueprint for a lot of this stuff. I do think the one thing that I would say, John, is I feel um, 
the the model that we're using right now of thinking about you know those 10 areas that I talked about I I think those can be applied across the board and having commissioners own that what what I can't stand is when um, someone says like, well, I think we should have a school of sustainability within the university or this or that. like, no, I need engineers who are integrating sustainability. I need poets who are integrating sustainability. I need doctors who are doing this, right? And I need humanitarians who are doing this. Like this is not, if sustainability is about three or four people in my office doing it for the university, we are DOA. Like mm -hmm. we're not gonna get there. Like that's not how we solve climate change. It's everyone's, everyone pollutes and it's everyone's job. And so how do we all do this? And yes, my job is to raise money for it, is to connect people, is to storytell. Like that's what I do, but we all have to do that. So I think in the case of the city, you know, it's gotta be, and, and Biden has said this, the president has said this, it's gotta be an all government approach. So the commissioners of those, areas, mobility, right? Buildings, if you will, or all the 10, it will might look, it probably will look different for the city, but figuring out who leads those, who are the committees that make that up that include some citizenry who have expertise in areas and building the strategy. To me, that that's where I think um, there's overlap and, and leveraging that model. But, uh, but I also think you have to kind of be invited into that conversation. Um, certainly, we talk with Kelly all the time and, and, and she's doing great stuff. I think, you know, we're, another model to look at, though, uh, also is the county. Um, you know, Bonnie Lawrence and the team over there have been doing amazing work. Uh, that climate action plan is just stellar. Like, I'm very jealous. It's, it's, it's awesome. And I, I can't commend them enough for the um, strategy and the effort that they put forth in that. So, you know, another one that you might not have on your radar is the amazing work that M&T has been doing. Like, they, like in, in two or three short years, they have built out an entire ESG team. Um, uh, Aaron has been leading that over there and has just been doing uh, phenomenal work with her team, uh, not only in their own business, but all of the the revenue, the finance, et cetera, and thinking about that from a risk perspective. And I've never met a banker who does things just because it's the right thing to do, right? They're doing it because of the risk and the business case, all like very logical, rational reasons to do that. And that's what actually gives me a lot of hope um, because if they're doing that, right, from a financial standpoint and a risk assessment, that means that we're starting to gain some some real arguments here and real traction that gives me gives me hope. Yeah. Ellen. I just wanted to mention, I certainly didn't plan it this way, but I happen to be wearing my UB alumni jacket. Love it. <laughs> class of you class of like middle ages. <laughs> 63. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I just want to congratulate you. It's just incredible what you're doing and just everything that you've accomplished already. So I, I just want to thank you. Well, Sarah, you're very generous. Um, we, uh, we're failing forward. We're learning this stuff as we go. We, uh, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and I, I, be, I do believe in celebrating milestones to try to keep people, um, you know, we have to try to walk this balance, especially with our students, right? Like between uh, telling them what's really happening, which they will, they know themselves and where the science is at. Like when I started that presentation, right? It's like a total Debbie Downer moment, but also like, how do we pivot on that? You know, Jane, Jane Goodall's, I think advice is just so awesome when it comes to hope, you know, it's not this Pollyannish, thing that we we focus on that is this uh idea of um you know we just oh you know we could just get there it's the idea that change only comes and and hope through action you must get in the arena and move you guys know this from the sierra club but like you can't think your way <laughs> to hope you can't like your emotions don't change unless you put one foot in front of the other and, and do that action. And there are a lot of great, um, a lot of great teammates 
a lot of great people at the university who, yeah, they get all the lot. I'm going to come full circle here. They get all the logical business case, all that, the law, this, that. But at the end of the day, they they just believe very strongly um, in in wanting to, to to make a better world for themselves and their kids and and their community. And so, um, it's a privilege to be able to work with them and um, and to to get to kind of help tell uh, some of their story. So, um, John, really appreciate your invitation uh, to me to to be able to share some time with you tonight and um, and everyone else for 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 joining um, and. Uh, Thank you uh, very much, Emma. Thank you for your for your comment there. Um, you guys are leading the charge, Emma, and we need you to keep doing that. But we also not to not to uh, let other generations off the hook, including my own here. Um, it's not it's not Z's job. I have two Z's in my well, one's at college and one's a senior in high school. I have two Z's, and it's not their job to fix this. It's their job mm -hmm. to be part of the the solution, but it's all of our jobs to fix this. Um, so thank you all very much. Um, have a yes, wonderful evening and, um, thank you for the work that the Sierra club is, is doing. Okay. Thank you again, Ryan. Great. Thanks. Um.